Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. And look who's here. Bernie popped in just in time. <laughs> in the nick of time. <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's okay. I figured that you were busy with somebody, and you pop in, and, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll show up eventually. Yeah. You never guess what the lawn problem was. Hmm. Let's see. Was it a St. Augustine lawn by any chance? Might have been, yeah. Okay. Well, as a matter of fact, if you look at our background behind our pictures here, you see a lot of dead turf grass. Mm -hmm. I decided to go with that background today because that is a picture of a very, very dead St. Augustine lawn and probably succumbed to a combination of take all root rot and very, very poor management and poor maintenance. So it's that time of year again. We're starting to get flooded with calls about why does my lawn look so bad? And what do I fertilize with? And uh, my, my lawn care person told me to water seven days a week. That would fix it. Colby probably doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> and none of those things are going to fix your lawn. So, hey, guys, welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. If anybody is here with us live watching, please feel free to say good morning, say hi. I see Buddy is here with us today. So good morning, buddy. And if anybody else has any questions, just go ahead and put them in the comments and we'll pull them up and we'll do our very best to answer them. But going back to, you can get a slightly better view of the background right now. That's a really sad lawn. And when I got this picture from this person, and I really hope that the owner of this lawn never tunes in to watch us live, you know, because <laughs> we don't want to, um, uh, make anybody feel bad about the lawn, but they were under the impression or what they had just done to this lawn is they had fertilized it and they were upset because they couldn't water it more than once a week, thinking that fertilizing it and watering it more than once a week is going to fix this lawn. And Bernie, do you think that's going to fix this lawn? Uh, no, it uh, definitely is beyond fertilizing and watering. Yeah, if your lawn gets to the point where it's anywhere near 50%, I'd say, or more, not what growing there. So if you're if the percentage of St. Augustine, if it's a St. Augustine lawn or Bahia or Zoysia or whatever turf grass you ideally want, drops to 50% or below, you're probably going to have to resize. It's really hard to get rid of the weeds and get the grass healthy and growing and have the grass actually fill in where you have a full lawn. So resodding time. And that's a lot of work. I've done that before. No, the, the number one problem is the lawnmowers. If, if you mow this grass at four inches, it produces a nice, healthy, long root and, and it provides water uh, and it, you can water once a week and everything's fine. If, if you mow it at two inches, the root structure only gets to be a couple of inches and it needs to be watered at least every other day to maintain uh, a healthy lawn in the summer. Well, you don't have that legal ability to water that often. So uh, the, the, on one hand, you can mow it at four inches and, and watering once a week is fine. Or on the other hand, you can mow it at two inches and watch it die. And uh, that's pretty much it. So, the, the, the very first thing that, the, about lawn care here is you have to mow at the correct height. And then this, the second thing is we have a lot of things that happen to lawns that don't happen up north. So uh, you have to go in and examine the lawn. And once you start having a problem, you need to make a correct diagnosis and, and a correct action because... Uh, under the right conditions, you can lose a lawn in as little as 30 days. So, you know, just being too lazy to walk out and see what's going on uh, can cost you a lawn. Well, uh, but it isn't that way up north. People up north have got it made. If, if you have a lawn problem and, and you're in Pennsylvania, you go out with a, a box of uh, fescue and Kentucky blue mix and you throw it around and, and you don't even have to worry about uh, anything else, the fact that it hit the ground, it'll grow. Uh, mm -hmm. 
but but if you're in Florida and you're at 28 degrees north latitude, think about this a minute. You go east and you go through the Sahara Desert and uh, the Arab Peninsula over there and um, you, you don't see any grass and you go west and you go through the desert southwest and uh, northern Mexico and you don't see any grass. We don't have any grasses to bring in that are going to be happy. So grass is an unhappy alien plant in Florida. And, and anytime you have that situation, you have to take care of it. And, and it's for the same reason you don't grow palm trees in New Jersey. You don't grow grass in Florida without doing a special effort. And uh, unfortunately, people just don't seem to, to get that message. And, and a lot of them, it, it's because uh, nobody ever told them, you know, you get no owner's manual when you come to Florida. So exactly. all the things that happen here, uh, you have to learn the hard way. And, and it's very, very hard when you just wiped out $6,000 worth of lawn uh, to, uh, to appreciate the fact that, that we can grow grass here, but it doesn't want to be here. You're, you're going to force something to happen that shouldn't be happening. And uh, I love it. I, I, it gives me a job. I get to talk to people. And, and the interesting thing is these people are really, they're grateful and they, and they listen. And, and it, it's nice to talk to people that, that really enjoy getting an education. So since master gardeners are educators, lawns give me the absolute best opportunity uh, to do the education. So uh, like, just like the woman that was in today, wonderful woman, um, understood exactly what needed to be done. And, and she's going to go home and uh, her poor husband is going to probably catch heck. But uh, <laughs> I think that, that, that she'll resolve the problem. And, and uh, you know, it, 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 if all you have to do is try and we're here to help. So and what can you plant in its place? There's a lot of things you can plant. It's what what do you wipe the looks of and are you in an HOA? And unfortunately, HOAs don't let you grow anything but uh, what they particularly want. So Yes. And when you move into an HOA neighborhood, you agree to the rules. People like HOAs because they know that all the neighbors' yards and houses are going to be kept up. And they don't have to worry about junked cars in the driveway or waist high weeds, things like that. But keeping a perfect looking lawn, depending on what the rules of your HOA are, can be very difficult. Some HOAs are not very strict. They only um, bother people, send them letters and threaten to find them over really egregious situations. Other ones can be really picky. Yeah. There are neighborhoods where they go around with the ruler and your lawn, if Monday morning your lawn is a quarter inch too high, they're going to put a letter on your door. You need to cut your grass and things like that. So it varies a lot. It can be a little difficult keeping your HOA happy. Uh, Margaret, if you don't live in an HOA, I know our uh, previous Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Lily Browning, had basically a freedom lawn and it was about half the hail. And the other half was whatever popped up and grew. And I have pretty much the same kind of lawn here. And it really comes down to what your goal is. My goal is to not get yelled at by my wife. She said that I need to keep the grass cut so it doesn't get too long. And she doesn't want to see bare dirt. She can't tell the difference between Bahia and St. Augustine and fog fruit and anything else. It's all green to her. She said, you know, keep the dirt covered, keep it cut, and she'll be happy, and I do that. So that's my goal. If you live in an HOA, you may have very, very different goals. So we try to figure out what your goal is a lot of times for starters and help you to get there, whatever your goal is. If you're going for that 100% absolutely perfect St. Augustine lawn and you live in Spring Hill in Hernando County, I can tell you right now it's going to be difficult. It's going to be expensive. And there's certain rules that you're going to have to follow and your lawn service and your spray service is going to have to follow. You can do it, but it's going to be a, a tough hill to climb, basically. And yeah, dogs are very hard on existing lawns. 
we've had Huskies and Huskies get the zoomies and they'll go out in the yard and they start going in circles and they'll um, definitely put a beating on your turf grass. Um, I'm not sure if Teresa is with us today or not. If she is, if she could look up ground covers, uh, you know, yeah, the, a ton of information on that. Yeah, the the there's a few um, IFIS articles on uh alternate ground covers and then like once you find uh a ground cover that you're interested in interested in if you like the look of it um if you check out the florida friendly landscaping plant guide uh m the ones that they recommend i think are all in there um and off of that it actually looks a little different now and i need because i don't know if you guys have the new ones yet uh but they uh they do have all of the, it tells you, you know, uh, plant hardiness zone, uh, salt tolerance, sunshade, uh, what have you, all, all like the various, uh, you know, stats and properties of each plant. Um, those will be in that plant guide. So um, once you find something you like, you can kind of test it or like look at look at it and see how it compares to the conditions at your location mm -hmm. i really like the, the, the is this. here with us today she put a link up to uh university of florida uh fact sheet on different ground covers yeah i i really like the the uh, island with with some um specimen plants and and reduce the amount of grass so uh you know you, you don't have to have a hundred percent well St. Augustine or 100% Bahia or whatever. Uh, you can uh, plant some shrubbery, uh, flowering shrubs, um, or put some annuals in a little bed and maybe have two or three little beds uh, and, and break the lawn up and, and yeah. get the amount of turf grass down. It, it's easier to take care of when you have less. Uh, and it, it You don't have to water mulch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're reducing the amount of turf grass you have. That's not only going to make it easier to keep what you have alive. It's going to help help out with your water bill. It's going to help out with your water consumption. Um, you know, it's a team effort to reduce water, and that's a, that's a really good way to do it. Because turf grass, like uh, we talked about earlier, it's not happy here. You're it 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 wants to just go away. It wants to die, and we're <laughs> just dragging it along. So um, by reducing the amount, you, you're going to save a lot of water. And need, turf grass, by nature, just needs a lot of water uh, compared to other uh, plants. So Probably the saddest part of the whole thing is that so many of the, the people that are commercially taking care of lawns do not understand the, the, the very simplest things in lawn maintenance. You know, uh, if, if you throw chemicals down 12 times a year, because it, it allows you to charge for spraying chemicals 12 times a year. That's not lawn maintenance. That's, that's charging for 12 times a year. And, and it borders on uh, being uh, the absolute worst thing you could do for the, the homeowner. So somebody needs to, to know. And, and generally, uh, in, in a, a homeowner situation where the, the HOA is, is forcing things to happen. Uh, the, the HOA will go out and, and get the, the lowest bid uh, for mowing, and the guy will come in, he'll cut it at two inches or whatever. Uh, he's bringing in the, the weed seeds that were on the mower from the last place he mowed, uh, and, and he, he has no desire to do anything because he's the cheapest guy. And as soon as he gets a better job, he's not going to be doing this anyway. So every every unemployed person with a pickup truck in the county tends to get a mower and go into the lawn care business. It's yeah. you know, and, and and it's very sad because it, it it doesn't do those people any real good, and it doesn't do the the customers any good at all. And the big commercial guys, uh, they they hire a, a minimum wage person to go out and spray. And, and they tell them, spray what's on your truck today, and, and next week we'll have a different spray. And, and uh, those people are not lawn care experts. So you, 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 if, you, if you do it like a golf course does, you get somebody that's a professional, and the professional comes by, 
and they look at the lawn and they say, hmm, today we need to do this. And they come by tomorrow and tomorrow they say, hey, we need to do this. And it costs you a ton of money. And and the truth is, lawns in, in uh, the warm grass areas are expensive because there are very few warm, warm season grasses. And uh, for the most part, they really don't want to be growing in warm season. You know, uh, I love the story about St. Augustine grass here. St. Augustine grass was found growing in a monastery in St. Augustine, Florida. Oh. They, don't, they don't know what the original history of the grass is, but it was growing. And, and my God. And it looks nice. Yeah, it's, it's the only, only wild grass that we found in Florida that made a lawn. And uh, the next thing you know, it's one of our biggest commercial grasses for the, the warmer areas. And... Uh, and it's an unknown history grass. We, all we know is that it started at a monastery. The, 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 the monks brought it in from someplace. And, and that's that's great. So, you know. And, and of course, the, the Floritam variety, the, the, the name Floritam comes from Florida and Texas A&M. So, uh, they, they did a lot of research. The uh, government spent a lot of money because the the golf association uh was was really pushing to get grasses that would make nice golf courses well now we have nice golf courses and the golf courses have a pro that takes care of them and and we have homeowners that move here from uh up north have no clues and and count on people to take care of their lawns that probably moved here from up north and have no clue either. So uh, I, I recommend that you go spend a few minutes with uh, somebody in the extension office. Get the story. We, we'll give you the, all the pamphlets on, on your particular type of grass, and we'll give you the background, and we'll tell you what needs to be done. We'll, we'll give you enough education that uh, these people will have a hard time taking advantage of you. Glad to do that. That's I love it. That That's why I'm here. I, I enjoy uh, discussing lawns. I, I, I've learned about them. Uh, I, I think they're a wonderful thing. Shouldn't even be in Florida. I'd, I'd just soon have chickens in the front yard, but the HOAs won't go along with that. So. Um, yeah, to touch... Enforcement might take issue with that. <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to touch on the HOA thing, if you live in an HOA and you're unsure, um, a big thing, just go ask. Go find your community manager. Find the uh, you know whoever whoever is the 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 chief over there and talk to him. Say hey, can I plant this? I need and and ask them to tell you specifically what you can and can't plant. Okay, and um, because I in my experience I, I've been really surprised that a lot of people I've talked to that were asking about I don't want St. Augustine grass. I don't want uh, I don't want turf at all. I want something else. Um, and I've told them, Hey, like just talk to your HOA, find out. And they've come back and say, no, they said I didn't have to have grass specifically. It just has to be green. It just has to have, you know, the, the bare dirt covered, which funny enough, that's a, that's a code. I think you can't, you're not supposed to have bare dirt in the County at all. I think I'd have to, I'd have to look that one up, but regardless, I'm not sure. Well, bare dirt. So it's for erosion. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, still, Go ask because you may you may be pleasantly surprised that you don't have to have turf grass even if you are in an HOA, or you may be able to um, cut back on the number of square feet of turf grass that you have. And mm -hmm. we've worked with at least one neighborhood that was having problems with a major die off of St. Augustine lawns. They were having to replace the lawns, and some of these homes had big yards. And the whole front yard was nothing but St. Augustine grass. Many, many pallets worth. And to replace that much grass is very, very expensive. But what they did was they started expanding on the size of the um, planting spots. And you don't have to fill it with high maintenance plants and be out there pulling weeds every day. You can put a large bed in, several shrubs, a tree, have it kind of keep, keep it minimal, keep it low maintenance. But that takes up more space so that your grass takes up less space. So when you have problems with the grass, you're not having to replace nearly as much. 
and they were able to save a lot of money that way. I'll tell you, I I think flowering trees in the front yard are very pretty. The, the thing about flowering trees is, for the most part, they tend to be smaller trees, so they don't grow out of scale uh, in your front yard. Magnolias do, but uh, most of the plants don't. Redbud or uh, the Chickasaw plums or some of those. And uh, some of the varieties of crepe myrtle, uh, you know, are 18, 20 foot trees, and that's as tall as they're going to get. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you can do some some very neat looking landscaping plants uh, and, and uh, put it in a bed. Uh, you know, you, you can reduce the amount of grass and, and actually it reduces the temperature in, in your yard. Uh, it, it, it has a lot of benefits. Uh, and, and it's not as, as boring as, as some of these for uh, they've mandated that every lawn has to be exactly the same, nothing to break up the lawns any place you, you look down the, and for an entire block, there's nothing but uh, St. Augustine. And then the next block, the entire block is nothing but St. Augustine. A lot of these newer places are doing a lot of landscaping in front and it really looks nice. You mm -hmm. know, uh, the, the, the classic two palm trees, and and that's it that you know that those days are pretty much over so uh yeah hopefully we've seen an end to building new neighborhoods and putting uh live oaks in the little um hell zone little space between the street and the sidewalk that's maybe six feet wide that's not large enough that's not enough space for a live oak and then 10 years down the road people are calling us saying our oak trees are making the sidewalk pop up what do we do <laughs> You shouldn't have put oaks in that spot. That's what you should have done. A little late then. So um, uh, I, I see. Lily has a comment here about uh, trimming the proper pruning methods for crepe myrtles. So um, I I don't know what department over there uh, is doing that. I, I wonder yeah, if it's I, like. I, do with it either, so. <laughs> I wonder if there's kids in in detention. I, once again, I'm no longer a resident of Sumter County. I live in Hernando County. Now, I would guess that if it was the Ag Department that was doing it, they probably wouldn't have done that. The Those folks are pretty knowledgeable over there. But uh, <laughs> those might be kids in detention or something. They're doing it as punishment. I have no idea. That's Do terrible. That? So... I mean, I mean, I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time in detention, but when I was in detention, I know I we cleaned the lunchroom a couple times, so I, they, they're not they, they'll make you do stuff. I know yeah. that. Um, so what Lily's referring to, crepe murder. Uh, I I saw that the uh, Master Gardener page actually just recently made a. It was like a movie poster for a horror movie. It was super, uh, super interesting. Um, but you don't want to prune your crepe myrtles down to nothing uh because that, that it ends up it i think they'll i think they actually do bloom kind of stronger but they the flowers are weak i think that it, it's it, there's a as with everything there's an ivis article that tells you um exactly yeah. how to do it do it correctly you, you don't, don't want to prune that severely just a light pruning prune off the old any old flowers any old seed pods things like that that are on the trip tips any broken branches, dead branches, prune all that out. And then after that, you can just leave them. And that is when they're going to flower the best. They're going to get the most flowers that way. So you don't have to over prune the heck out of them just because your neighbors do, or even worse, you might see county workers doing it alongside of the road. We always cringe when we see that, or maybe you see the poor kids in detention but they might have done it on purpose because they were in detention. I don't know. I don't know the background. No, no. Uh, actually, she just mentioned down there that there was an incident. And uh, my little sister's still a student um, at the high school, and she uh, actually just talked to her this morning, and she was telling me about it. So yeah, they were not. They were not in the school. Um, so when they have fire drills, do they all? Well, hey, since we got all the kids outside for a fire drill, let's do it. <laughs> I have no idea. I've been out of high school for a little while now. <laughs> the, the okay, sad part. Said, we don't know the details behind that one but we don't recommend pruning the heck out of your crepe myrtles just because maybe you've always done it your neighbors do it and you think well i have to do it no no, no you don't have to do it that way 
A light pruning is going to make your crepe myrtles healthier. You're going to get more flowering from them. And remember, depending on what variety you put in, some crepe myrtles, the white one, what is that, Natchez, I think, Bernie? Yeah, there's over a hundred The white one's going to get as tall as your house. So give them lots of room to grow. Yeah, there's there's over a hundred varieties of, yeah. of crepe myrtle, and and the, the dwarfs start at uh, about four foot. Actually, the dwarfs start at three foot. I I have some twenty year old crepe myrtles that are only three foot tall, bloom every year. So from from three foot to to forty five feet, there's there's a crepe myrtle in in various colors and in various heights. And, and everybody goes out and they buy crepe myrtle. They don't know what variety they've got, what it is. Maybe it's a bush. Maybe it's a tree. Maybe it's going to be 50 feet tall. Maybe it's going to only be 10 feet tall. They, they take it home. They plant it. It looks nice the first year. Their neighbor comes running over. Oh, my God, you've got to cut that thing back now. You know, it, it's fall. It's time to chop. And they whack it off. Here, here's a tree that had a perfect shape, and because the neighbor comes running over, they end up chopping it up, and next year, it, it tries to recover, and it, and it looks reasonable, so, hey, it worked last time, I'll cut it again, and, and you'd start this cycle of every year you chop the tree back, not having any clue why, and there is nothing uglier than one of those crepe myrtles cut back with those big knobby things at the ends of the branches. I just despise that. You know, if, if you want a polarization uh, of a crepe myrtle, there there's a, a, a specific way to do it. And and if you have a, a English gardener that's going to come in and, and take care of it every year, that's great. But otherwise, leave the darn things alone. They, they, you know, Make sure that you bought the one that you thought you did to, you know, ask some questions. If if you go to the, the big box store and they have a plant and it says crepe myrtle and you you ask them, what about this thing? What's its ultimate height going to be? I don't know. What color is it? I don't know. You know, and, and you take it home and plant it and it's, and it's pink and you wanted red, that's your fault. And if it's a, a five foot tree and you wanted a 20 foot tree, that's your fault. And if it's a 25-foot tree and you wanted a 10-foot tree, that's your fault. If you don't do the, the education, then the, nobody comes out good on this thing except for the guy that sold it to you. So, yeah. you, know, you know, like I say, there's a, there's a hundred, more than a hundred named varieties of crepe myrtle in, in at least four different colors and, and 20 different heights. So... Um, and they sure do have dwarf ones really, now, and the dwarfs really are dwarf. They stay small. Yeah. So we got a question from Andrew Dave here about fertilizing mango trees. Hopefully you live south of me in Spring Hill in Hernando County and not north of me because mangoes can do really well. You know, they grow a lot of mangoes down in... Um, Pinellas County in Tarpon Springs. Apparently they have a lot of mangoes and that's what 30, 40 minutes South of where I am right now. So we're, I'm kind of right on the line here. I need to get a mango and give them a try, but definitely South of here, you can grow mangoes and, um, uh, mangoes, probably the best fertilizer would be a citrus fertilizer because that way, you know that you're getting all the micronutrients, which mangoes are not really, really fussy on, but still it's always a really good idea to cover your bases. So I recommend a quality citrus fertilizer. And then during the growing season, fertilize it very, very lightly, scatter the fertilizer lightly and evenly about every month or so to keep it growing well during the summer, because that's the time of year when they're gonna grow here. If you live in Miami, they grow pretty much year round down there. So the care is going to be a little bit different. Uh, got a question about palm trees. Margaret asks, 
Can I plant palm trees near a poolside or are the roots going to be a problem? What do you think, Bernie? The roots aren't going to be a problem, but everything else about the palm tree is going to be a problem. It's not going to like the chlorine water from the pool if it's, if it's getting wet. So it needs to be a, a far enough away from the pool that it's not being watered from the pool water. And which gives me an opportunity to bring up something I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. The fertilizing of palm trees. Everybody puts in a palm tree and it's in the yard and they fertilize the yard. They fertilize the lawn and the palm tree is being fertilized with lawn fertilizer. Terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. Lawn fertilizer eventually does very bad things to palm trees. Takes a long time to happen. Takes a long time to correct. Palm trees need a, a, a very unique specialized fertilizer. It needs slow release, uh, especially in the uh, nitrogen, potassium, mag magnesium. All three need to be uh, uh, pretty much uniform throughout the growing season. So that means that you need slow release. If you just use lawn fertilizer, it takes all the nitrogen immediately, goes into super grow mode, then it runs out of potassium and magnesium and, and the leaves start to turn yellow. It gets some, some deficiencies and that's not good for the plant. Eventually it's very bad for the plant. So if, if you put palm trees in and they're in the landscape, don't use the lawn fertilizer around the palm trees. Use palm fertilizer and let that take care of the grass. Palm fertilizer is a super great fertilizer. It will actually do a better job for your lawn than the lawn fertilizer, but it costs like three times as much money. Yeah, so, it gets a little expensive to do the whole yard with it. So use the palm fertilizer around the palm trees. Don't use the lawn fertilizer. Uh, and, and if you put your palm tree by the pool, uh, you know, that's, that in itself is not going to be a problem. The, the roots are not uh, destructive on palm trees. But the, the fertilization, the care of the tree uh, becomes critical. You, ne you need to, to make sure that it, it is uh, fertilized with the, wrong, with the right fertilizer and that if you start developing any problems, uh, that you get them taken care of. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Palm trees have very few actual diseases. Uh, there's there's a, uh, about three fungal diseases that attack palm trees, a bacterial disease that attacks palm trees, and an insect that attacks palm trees. Those things, those five things, pretty much are all the actual diseases that palms get. All, all of them are fatal. So, you know, if you actually get a disease, you're going to lose your palm tree. But the nutritional problems are tremendous on palm trees. Almost always, wow. Uh, if, if you start having problems with the palms, it's nutritional and it goes back to fertilizing it incorrect. You don't just throw Epsom salts on the ground to give it magnesium. You don't use lawn fertilizer. You don't use 10, 10, 10. You use a specialized fertilizer if you want to take care of the plant. So, you know, if, if you've got a hundred dollar palm, uh, you, you're probably going to cry when you find out it costs $50 for a bag of fertilizer but a bag of fertilizer will take care of that palm for uh, three, four years. Uh, yeah, it goes a long way. It goes a, a long time. But if you've got one of this $2,500 or, or $3,000 or $10,000 palm trees, which there are a lot of them around anymore, uh, you, you really should be taking good care of it. You know, it's, uh, you, you feed your dog best, the best food you can, feed your tree the best thing you can, and, and you get a lot better happiness and better life out of all of them. So uh, I really don't care about good your tree as much as I do your dog, though. So give your dog something really good. So Aunt you, Dave, with the mango tree, lives in Tavares. Tavares is probably also on the line for mangoes, but she said it's produced fruit, so that's great. Uh, just have to keep that those mangoes from freezing 
during the winters when we have really bad freezes. And she's also growing seeds of beans, coriander, and hot peppers. But the coriander or cilantro have not seen any green leaves. But the pepper and fenugreek are doing great. Coriander or cilantro, you need to grow during the winter. So planting it right now is probably a little bit too late. It likes the cool weather, so you would plant it normally September or October. Oh, definitely by October, you're safe. It's, you know, things have generally cooled off and grow it all winter long. So cilantro, dill, parsley, and fennel. If anybody grows fennel, kind of an odd vegetable or herb or whichever it is, those all like cool weather. You have to grow them during the winter, and they're all pretty much finishing up right about now. I have a huge dill plant, a couple of dill plants out in the garden. I need to go out there and use it and harvest it because it's going to be gone soon. It's going to be burning up as the temperature warms up, but they grow great during the winter. A dill is really, really easy. You only need a few plants. I mean, you can only use just so much dill. You know, there are a lot of uh, microclimates in the Tiberias area. She can probably get by growing a lot of things. Basically, she's 10 degrees warmer than we are. So, you know, a lot of lakes over there also. So if you're near a lake in Lake County, that's how it got its name. Uh, if you ever look at a map, there's lots and lots of, you know, blue circles over there. That helps to keep things a little bit warmer on a really cold winter night, too. So Margaret says she has one more question. Passion fruit vine in the landscape, pros and cons. I think it's a great plan. So do I. One pro is if you plant the right variety of passion vine um, and the, the native one, the maypop, I believe, the purple and white one is a host plant for... Um, Gulf fritillaries and zebra longwings, and one or two other butterflies you don't see nearly as often on them. So if you have a lot of passion vines and you let the caterpillars eat the heck out of them, you will have lots of butterflies through the whole second half of summer, guaranteed. I do every year. I let it, I'm trying to grow it up a palm tree and my neighbors have some just on the other side of the fence, but um, passion vine, grows like a weed underground and spreads so i always have lots of butterflies yeah i i had the butter the uh, caterpillars take out about seven feet of uh, passion vine basically in two days i couldn't believe how quick it disappeared so uh that that is a great butterfly plant and and it is a good producer i love the pur the purple one uh the the red one is not very good for butterflies. They don't seem no. to uh, have anything to do with it at all. But the, the, the purple one, you'll have caterpillars. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if you've got some place you can just plant it and let it vine a fence or uh, uh, a trellis or anything, uh, it's a great plant. And, and if, if they don't nail it real quick, uh, it can get to be 25, 30 foot vine. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and they flower. The flowers are beautiful. Uh, you can get fruit off of them. Mine only set a few fruit every summer, but I'm not really growing it for fruit production. So it doesn't really matter to me. It needs a lot of phosphorus if, if you're going to do the fruit. So, um, yeah. use a bloom buster fertilizer if you actually want to produce fruit. Yeah. And there are, um, they do raise uh, passion fruit commercially, mostly in South Florida down at Homestead, but you can grow it as far north as Ocala, um, up in, with Marion County Extension. There's an extension agent up there who's an expert on it. I have to have him come do a class about passion vine and passion fruit. He knows much more about growing it for the fruit than I do. I just grow it for the flowers and for the caterpillars. And Andrew Dave says, yes, she lives in Tiberias and her backyard has tons of trees, which also help to keep things a little bit warmer underneath. So on a cold night, trees will help to hold in the heat from the soil and keep you just a couple degrees warmer. So things won't freeze quite as badly. 
So, hey, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. Let me start um, showing some contact information here. If afterwards, or if you're watching this as a recording, welcome. Um, if you have any lawn and garden questions, feel free to shoot me an email. There is my email. If you would like to contact Bernie, Bernie is at our office pretty much every Thursday. And there is a phone number. If you were to call as soon as we get done here, Teresa would answer the phone and she transfer you back to Bernie. So this is all a team effort here. We all work together. Um, let's see, we have, let's scroll down to Colby here. Colby has an email also, but it's a Hernando County email. And they're really long and really hard to remember. With <laughs> all the dot US's and FL's and everything, it just confuses me. So to make it shorter and easier, if you go to his link tree, that's going to have links to what your Facebook page also. Uh, ways to yeah, all of the uh, all the social medias that I run are there. Um, I think there's actually even a link that you can click on to send me an email. Um, and any of the like the current events I have going on. So right now, that's up. What's up there is our rain barrel and compost bin workshop uh, that'll be held on the twenty second. Um, spots if you're interested in that. Spots are it's filling up kind of quickly. Um, uh, I'm actually a little surprised, but uh, it'll be. Uh, uh, I think there's like there's only like three or four spots left. So if you're interested in it, you can go to that link tree and uh, sign up to get a free compost bin or a uh, if you are a Hernando County resident. Can't beat free. Mm -mm. Yeah, one of the one of the things that people need to be doing now is weed control. This this is going to be one of the worst weed seasons people have seen in years. And uh, you know, if, if you go out and, and spray some weed killer now, it's a little late for the uh, pre-emergent. We've, we've had yeah. enough warm weather that the, the weeds have germinated. I went out and mowed the yard yesterday. I don't think I hit any grass at all. The grass had never grown. But man, did I mow a ton of weeds. And uh, they I grow fast. No, they do, and, and it, you know, this is the time. If, if you wait until they get any bigger, they're harder to control. So uh, get out there, and those, those, especially the backyards. Nobody seems to care uh, much about their backyard, so they let the backyard go, and they, they keep the front yard really nice. Well, now all these weed seeds are going to blow in your front yard, so don't let the... the Plants go to seed, and 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 it's probably late. A lot of those those things are, are flowering, but uh, good time to do weed control. It's it's early, but yeah, it, it there's enough things up. Uh, it's time to start spraying. Yeah, we've been I've been getting emails for weed identification. What do I use? And it's just another re important reason why you need to manage your lawn correctly, especially with St. Augustine lawns. If you cut that grass really tall, it will help shade out and suppress a certain amount of the weeds. You may still get some weeds, but you're not going to get nearly as many. So if you look at our background picture here of this, what used to be a St. Augustine lawn, which is now half bare dirt, half, you know, dead residue of this and that. If I knew what their address was, I'd probably go by and at least do a drive by and get a picture of what it looks like now. That's got to be packed full of weeds because there's no grass. And if you have just bare dirt here in Florida, it doesn't stay bare for long. You will get weeds. So the thinner and unhealthier your lawn is and the shorter you keep it cut, the more weeds you're going to end up with. And then if you treat for weeds and you're successful in what you use works really really well now you have a yard full of dead weeds and then if you still don't do something to replace the grass more weeds are going to come along so you end up in this this constant circle of killing the weeds they come back you kill them they come back and you you never get ahead so that's that's not a good recipe for success really one of one of the things you have to be very careful of uh so many of the uh, weed killers say safe for St. Augustine. 
And then in the very fine print on the back, down at the bottom, it says, great for St. Augustine, except Floritam. Well, most people have Floritam St. Augustine. so Almost everybody does. Yeah, so uh, those things, the reason it, it accepts Floritam is that it kills Floritam. So, uh, so, so read that label carefully and make sure whatever you're thinking about purchasing and using is labeled for the type of grafts that you have. So if it's St. Augustine, it needs to be safe for St. Augustine. You need to check the fine print. Make sure there isn't something that says not safe for Floritam because you probably have Floritam. And if you have a Bahia lawn, you have to get only products that are labeled to be used on Bahia lawns. If you mix them up, you may apply them and kill your entire lawn. We see that, what, two, three times every summer from yeah. somebody who used the incorrect weed and feed. And you can kill your entire yard and you will have to resod it. So don't make that mistake. Very, very expensive read the label very, very carefully before you purchase a product and then read it again all the way through before you mix it, apply it, make sure you're wearing all the correct safety equipment. I know Colby has a lot of experience with that, with having worked with Swift Mud and treating for invasive plants. I'm sure you labels, right? You, you kind of cut out there, what'd you say? Oh, I said, I'm sure that you guys read the labels before. Oh. You yeah, so, so it, it reading the label was such a big deal that um, I actually went through and found PDFs of all of the labels, and we had a big, massive manual of every label, every SDS of every herbicide we use because you may need to refer to it. Um, it's super important, and reading those labels can a lot of times it gives you insight on how to use the herbicide and what it's actually good for. Um, there's a lot of code words in there that you may not know the meaning of, but if you Google it, it'll tell you exactly what it does. And then you can kind of relate that back to like, you know, your, the connotative meaning of the things that we're talking about. Um, and if you just follow what the label of the herbicide says, normally that's how it works the best. They spend a whole lot of money to figure out exactly how it works the best and to tell you, so you buy, so it works. So you keep buying it. Yeah. One of, one of the products that really works good on, uh, St. Augustine is MSM. The problem with it is it kills oak trees. So if you have oak trees in your lawn, be very careful. Do not use a product with MSM. Although it's the most effective probably of all the St. Augustine weed killers, uh, it is probably the scariest uh, if you have trees. So, And I believe that is on the label now. There is a caution statement for it. So that's another important thing that's on the label is all the different plants that you do not want to apply that product to or near or on top of. Can't tell you how many people I've talked to who said, I sprayed this, you know, insecticide on these hedges and now they're all dead. And while they're telling me that, I'm Googling the product and pulling up the label and it says on the label, do not use this on that plant. Had they read the label, they wouldn't have killed the plant. So. Everything you need to know is on the label to keep you safe, your plants safe, and for you to um, get the kind of results that you're shooting for. You know, you fertilize your lawn you, because you want your lawn to look good, not because you want your lawn to be dead. So if you follow the directions, you're going to get to where you want to be, not to where you don't want to be. Yeah, a lot of the weed control products are, are toxic above 85 degrees. Yes. So... So temperature is very important. And, and every once in a while, we'll have somebody uh, bring us a picture of, of a totally dead lawn. And it's because they went out at 92 degrees, 94 degrees, and put down weed and feed. And you can see the, the, the marks from the spreader. It would drop spreader every, wherever place the spreader went. The, the lawn went too. So... Yeah. Uh, Word of caution there, don't do not do uh, weed control when temperature's above 85 degrees. You know, when you poison the, the weeds, you poison everything. You, you, the, the, the poison doesn't just go to the, the weeds, it also falls on the, the grass. And the grass pretty much has the ability to metabolize that particular chemistry. But it can't once it gets above 85 degrees. So. Uh, you're poisoning everything, and and 
you actually show it once you get above 85. So that that's very, very critical. Please don't kill your lawn completely from that. Yes, we don't want to see more pictures of dead lawns. And all the information on uh, temperature restrictions is in the label also. So just another reason to read the entire label all the way through. We need to wrap it up in just a moment or two here or so. If anybody has any last minute questions or comments, if you want to toss them in really quickly, um, let me go over and check my calendar. Oh, I will not be here next week. So are you guys able to handle it on your own? I think we got it. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. I've been getting um, dragged all over the state for a lot of different reasons recently. <laughs> so, um, Within the next month or so, hopefully everything will settle down and I'll be back on a fairly regular schedule and be here every week. But I don't worry because no matter where I am, I just I pick up my phone at 10 o'clock Thursday morning and these guys are on here handling everything for me. So we appreciate that. And want to make a special thank you to Teresa also. I could not make it through the week and probably not even through the day without Teresa's help. So, Teresa, thank you so much for all you do here on the virtual plant clinic and phone calls and emails and sending, putting up displays and designing things and everything else you do. So, one last comment here. Amory is getting ready to put plants in the ground. Busy time of year here. Yeah, it's a busy time of year here also for us. Lots of questions. Lots of things going on, lots of fairs and festivals and everything. Thank you so much. Can't wait for the veggies. I can't wait either. Um, I did actually plant something on time about a week ago. I got a bunch of green beans and yellow, the big flat potted pole beans planted in my garden that are coming up. And if I get out there and water them today and keep them watered, they'll keep coming up and doing well. So, so hopefully I'll be able to share pictures of a bumper crop of green beans with everybody in the not too distant future. And Teresa, thanks again. So, Hey guys, I think that we're going to wrap it up here. So we will be back next week, next Thursday at 10 AM. Thank you all so much for tuning in with your questions, comments, everything else. And thank you to everybody who watches this, the, the recorded version. Um, I know a lot of people do. So if you're watching this as a recording and you have specific questions, just reach out, shoot us an email, send us lots and lots of pictures, and we'll get back to you with an answer or to let you know that we need more information or whatever we need to help you figure out what your problem is and get your garden and your lawn back in shape so it does not look like the one in the background here. We don't want that. So, hey, everyone, thank you so much. We'll see you again next week. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.